everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. In this program, we've got Dr. Craig Keener with us, and we're responding to the cessationist documentary. You guys stay tuned. It's going to be a great program. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a show where we tackle history, theology, and the gifts of the Spirit. My name is Joshua Lewis. I'm the pastor of King's Fellowship in Ada, Oklahoma, together with my friends Michael Miller at Reclamation Church Denver and Michael Roundtree at Bridgeway Church OKC. We set aside time every week to discuss the gifts of the Spirit. Things like, how should we pray for the sick? And how do we interpret tongues? And should we believe all the prophetic words for the new year? If you're looking for a charismatic podcast with practitioners who are actually doing the stuff, this is the show for you. We have a guest back on the show today by the name of Dr. Craig Keener. He's been with us multiple times. We filmed a series on the book of Mark. Uh, we've done some stuff on eschatology and the end times. We've done stuff on women in ministry. Dr. Craig Keener is a respected voice in the charismatic Pentecostal space. Uh, he is a charismatic scholar former president of the Evangelical Theological Society, and officially, uh, this is factually proven, uh, will forget more than I will ever learn. So uh, it's an honor once again to have him on the program today, Dr. Keener. So thank you so much for joining us. Th thank you for having me. I, I don't know, uh, you're not done learning yet, so I don't think it's empirically proven, your, your statement. Uh, but I've met you. We've had some conversations. I feel like it's true. <laughs> Dr. Keener, you're I know, already I using the trajectory words we're on. Josh knows. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Keener, uh, maybe tell us a little about yourself and your ministry before we dive into the program. Uh, but then I also would love to hear you kind of give us some of your thoughts on the cessationist documentary, just kind of as a whole, because you, you, when we reached out to you and said, hey, we would love for you to uh, engage with us on, on this subject, you're like, I should probably go watch the whole documentary. So I'd, I'd one, like to know a little bit about you, but then also some of your thoughts on the cessationist documentary. Sure. I was converted through an experience with the Spirit after some people brought me the gospel, who happened, by the way, I, I'm assuming, I don't know this for a fact, but I think they were cessationist. So God's Spirit works through cessationists too. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so I was converted uh, 40 some, 40, well, I'm, math isn't my major anyway, it was back in 75. Um, and then I did my uh, master's work at the Symbols of God Seminary and my PhD at Duke University. And I've written 35 books so far. And the biggest is the Acts, well, the first Acts commentary, which is like 4,500 pages long, 45,000 extra biblical ancient sources. So I do agree with the person on the uh, video who said, you need to take into account the background. Of course, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the background, New Testament background commentary. Uh, that's sold like over half a million copies. And yeah, mainly my gift is teaching privately. It's tongues, but uh, that happened to me like two days after I was converted. I didn't know what it was. It just happened to me. So it wasn't like I was taught to do that or anything. And what else should I say? My wife is Medine Musunga Keener. She's from Congo in Central Africa. And I'm a professor at Asbury Theological Seminary in New Testament. I teach in the PhD program, and I also teach the intro classes for the Master of Divinity students. So I get the, the whole range. As far as the cessationism video, um, I was like, I'm pretty busy, but I actually better go watch this. So I did watch it, and ah, the production quality is excellent. But the content. Be careful! Is... They're going to take a clip of you saying that. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Documentary. I've said the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> They've done that. Exactly. To, I think it's things, hilarious, but things do get quoted out of context. But anyway, uh, yeah, things get quoted out of context in the video, both scripture and clips of people speaking. Uh, and anyway, I was kind of horrified by the exegesis. It's abysmal. So, uh, in terms of the. And also in terms of the argumentation, sometimes, I mean, in persuasion theory, they talk about uh, how you falsely link things together. You know, everybody knows A is bad, so you include B in A, and then everybody throws it out. So you take the worst excesses in the charismatic movement, uh, extremes that most charismatics would repudiate, and you throw in the, with them... Um, D.A. Carson and John Piper and people like that. And you say, they're all bad. 
uh, they, they, they did qualify that a bit, but I mean, it was, the argumentation was, was poor. The exegesis was abysmal yeah. in, in most cases. Some of them did better than others. So, you know, I'm just seeing clips from different ones, but some of them were like, uh, yeah, the, I, 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 I like that. What was the yeah. word? What was the most egregious exegetical error that you remember off the top of your mind? Oh, I don't remember. I'd have to go look at my notes. There were there oh, were plenty of yeah, them. No worries. But we have clips that we can refresh your memory. And, uh, you know, you got all that, like, I don't know, 45,000 ancient sources in the back of your mind. So we can understand if. Uh, well, what's funny to me is like you. Movie memorized. You brought up two What's things that? that I thought were hilarious. One, you know, comparing people to the worst charismatics ever, but they kind of qualified it. I liked it how in the clip that you're referring to, they were like, I'm not trying to say that Sam Storms is equal as Benny Hinn. However, Satan was the one in the garden who says God's word's not enough. So instead of comparing him to Benny Hinn, he compares him to Satan, which I thought was, uh, man, I, thought, I didn't know what was worse. <laughs> Um, and then I love this because this is, if you don't know what this is, uh, Crossway published a little kind of like a reader's versions of books of the Bible. So this is Galatians. So this actually is the book of Galatians, including space for writing notes. This is Dr. Craig Keener's commentary on Galatians. Okay, So if you're talking about background and history and all that stuff. And, and one of the, the great joys in life uh, to have Dr. Keener on is his two volume works on miracles. So we're, we're sitting here talking about the cessationist movie with a guy who has done extensive research on modern day miracles and 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 uh, miracles throughout church history. So uh, we're very excited to dive into the program today. Uh, in, you guys, Michael, Michael, do you have anything you want to add before we start watching some video clips? Not me. Cool. Let's watch that beautiful bean footage. It's not so much that I'm defending Agabus's reputation. Agabus is in heaven. He doesn't care. It's that Agabus is quoting the Holy Spirit. And Luke records that quote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we have a quote from the Holy Spirit recorded in the Holy Spirit inspired scriptures. If you're telling me that the details of that quote are wrong, you're telling me that the Holy Spirit got something wrong. And that is blasphemous. Okay, this is a short clip picking up from our last uh, installment talking about prophecy here. Uh, the argumentation was that Agabus got some kind of prophetic word wrong in in oh, Acts. Wait. And we have kind of argued that um, in the past, recently have reformed uh, our position on this to say, hey, uh, we don't think that Agabus got it wrong, but we do think that those who urged Paul in the spirit in Acts 21.4 uh, were probably the ones that uh, you know, got it wrong as you will, because they were urging him in the spirit not to go to Jerusalem. So uh, he is arguing about Agabus, but I still think that there might be some room for us to talk about this issue uh, with our interpretation of Acts 21.4. Uh, Dr. Keener, uh, I just kind of toss it over to you to, to start with. Sure. I mean, Agabus says the Jews will bind him, and that's not what happens in Acts 21 and 22. It does appear in a later summary in Acts, which I think, you know, going on with the clip, he does he does point that out. But that brings into question, well, is Luke wrong? And I would say, no, he's not wrong. But but there's flexibility in how things can be recounted, which means that the standard that they're using is a standard that would bring the authority of Scripture into question, which I think is not what they mean to do, but it means that they probably haven't read scripture very clearly. I mean, it's like, you know, Matthew speaks of kingdom of heaven. Mark speaks of kingdom of God. Well, it means the same thing, right? But but it's different wording. You can't do that. So uh, I, I, I don't think they're, I don't think somebody who actually reads the scripture enough is going to like hold to that wooden way of, of looking at prophecy has to be exact wording because it wasn't like exactly that way in the, in the book of Acts. Now, having said that, I don't think Agabus got it wrong. I think that the standard that this person is using for prophecy is wrong. It doesn't meet biblical criteria for expectations for prophecy. Uh, but, but, you know, Agabus is basically right. I think God did tell Paul back in Acts 19 by the Spirit that he should go to Jerusalem, 
and that's what he's doing. And Agabus just warns him what's going to happen to him, the general sense of that, uh, which I think fits the way prophecy often works in scripture. Uh, there's some poetic license, you might say. Uh, actually, a lot of biblical prophecy is in poetry, especially the pre-exilic prophetic books. And then also uh, in Acts 21.4, when they say to him through the Spirit, I think maybe the reason Luke doesn't call it prophecy is because, you know, they're urging him not to go and God has already told him to go. But they're doing it through the Spirit. They've heard from the Spirit and their love for Paul, their concern for Paul is certainly consistent with the Spirit. And this brings up some of the messiness of prophecy. If you're going to have prophecy, it has to be tested. It has to be discerned. All of them. We all, they say, uh, Luke says. So Luke himself, uh, Philip's four daughters who are prophetesses, Philip, Agabus, we all tried to get him not to go to Jerusalem. And finally, Paul says, you know, I'm going to do it. And they say the will of the Lord be done. They acknowledge that he's he's right, that God is, God is in this, uh, at least you know, on the ultimate level, God is in this. If you're going to have prophecy, you're going to have a mess. You need to have discernment. The biblical solution for that, though, is discernment. 1 Corinthians 14, 29 and 1 Thessalonians 5. So when we don't discern prophecy, like we see Paul doing, or Paul does discern prophecy in Acts 21. If we don't discern or try to interpret prophecy, then we're disobeying scripture. But that means that the people who throw the baby out with the bathwater are also disobeying scripture. That's good. Dr. Keener, you know, we've we've done a couple of videos on Acts uh, 21, 4 through 6, them urging in the spirit not to go to Jerusalem. Uh, also, we've done 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 17, where Nathan uh, will, yeah. is standing in the, the office of the court prophet, and David comes to him and asks him, hey, can I build a temple? And Nathan's exactly. like, hey, the Lord's with you, buddy. And then later comes back after God speaks to him in a dream and goes, hey, this is for your kid. This isn't for you. Now, yeah. what I think is interesting about what you just said, the act, the verses that we typically use to say prophets can miss it, we, we go to 2 Samuel 7, and we also go to Acts 21. Both of those accounts don't actually use the words like, thus saith the Lord, or the word of the Lord came to me, or those kinds of things. They kind of shroud the prophetic utterance to do, I think, the very thing that Nathan is uh, afraid that we're actually doing. Because we would agree that any prophecy that is canonized in a phrase that thus saith the Lord, we would go, ah, yes, this is scripture and this is infallible and this is inerrant. However, I think he's confusing our position, which says, yes, all scripture is infallible and inerrant, but, uh, and all revelation that comes from God is infallible and inerrant, but the interpretation and then application from the prophet can have error in the same way that the scriptures are inerrant, but through our teaching and preaching can have some kind of mixture. Do you think that that would be an appropriate understanding of Second Samuel is to say that the the reason it doesn't say, thus saith the Lord, as Nathan is speaking to, to, to David, I mean, clearly Nathan is not being asked as like a, you know, an architect or, you know, uh, a good <laughs> friend of David. He's being asked as the prophet. Hey, yeah. you know, uh, Nathan, is the Lord with me? And he's he is speaking on behalf of the Lord, even though it's not recorded that he is speaking on behalf of the Lord. Would you think that that's a, a fair interpretation of that? Yeah, we have to distinguish between prophecy and what's authoritative scripture. Canon means a measuring stick. There are lots of prophets in Jeremiah's day. Most of them were false. Well, how do you know which one's true? <laughs> well, within a generation, actually much shorter than that, you find out and so guess whose book makes it in the Bible? You know, the Bible is tested. And so we have that as authoritative in a way that, you know, prophecy that's untested isn't. You also have like 1 Samuel chapter 16, where, you know, the first son of Jesse passes before Samuel. And Samuel says, surely the Lord's anointed is here. And the Lord says, uh -uh, not that one. <laughs> and it keeps being, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> and, and finally he's like, well, the Lord told me it was going to be one of these sons, but hmm, he's not here yet. You have any other sons? Well, it turns out, yes, we do. <laughs> so you have that a number of times where the, the prophet is fallible in himself or herself, but 
what we have in Scripture recorded as the word of the Lord that we can we can depend on. Yeah, I, so I like that because oh, go ahead, Miller. You haven't spoken much yet, so Miller, why don't you take a take a turn? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so Nathan though he says that if the if Agabus had gotten it wrong, then the Holy Spirit got it wrong, and therefore we can't rely on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is is not the Holy Spirit would be fallible at that point. He basically says that this is blasphemous, but I think you know he's saying if this, then this. And I would disagree with this, if A, then B happens. What would you say about that, that logic? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we do have prophets who got things wrong, like we've just been talking about. So the, the A and then B doesn't work. Although in those cases, they didn't say thus says the Holy Spirit. But you do have people who say thus says the Lord in Scripture and they're false prophets. So... Mm -hmm. um, just because scripture records it the question is why does scripture record it and i think in this case you know it is a true prophecy from the lord and it it fits the idea that paul didn't mess up when he went to jerusalem paul knew that god was calling him to go there and he was in god's will but Absolutely. you would you would generally agree with the idea that um if it's recorded in scripture thus saith the lord then because the scriptures are inerrant, then that, that, that phrase, whatever's coming following the thus saith the Lord, or whatever's following uh, the word of the Lord came to me, whatever that is, is in fact infallible. So it's really important that people understand in the same way that we think teaching is fallible, but the teachings of scripture are infallible. We think prophecy is fallible, but the prophecies of scripture are infallible. Does that make sense to people? If it's canonized in the scripture, it's recorded as in the Bible as saying, this is what the Lord has said. Right. We acknowledge that that is in fact infallible and inerrant because it is scripture, not because it is prophecy. Um, but but yeah, I think Josh, I, I kind of want to hop in on that because both you and Miller are kind of touching on what I was wanting to say. And that is that I, I think the person speaking is mistaking the type of the genre of book of scripture we're talking about this is a narrative uh it's not uh it's not like isaiah when isaiah says thus says the lord and we have that prophecy recorded in scripture it's a prophetic book and we're to receive we are to receive that as the word of god when we come to a narrative and it says agabus said thus says the holy spirit now agabus could be right or wrong we, we believe he was right and and we don't get me wrong. We believe every jot and tittle of scripture is inspired, inerrant, authoritative, all the things. But we have to pay attention to the genre. We have to pay attention. Like, just, it, it's really like he's, and we see this throughout the documentary, uh, he's baking his, uh, he, he's baking his conclusion into the premise. Uh, in, in the way, his, his conclusion is, you can't miss a prophecy. And then he jumps in to a narrative book and says, uh, well, that person couldn't have missed the prophecy because if he did, since it said Holy Spirit said, it must be blasphemy. And we're saying, no, like the, the, the Holy Spirit in his inspired word could record a missed prophecy or he could record an accurate prophecy, even if the person says, thus says the Lord or thus says the Holy Spirit, which Craig, I, I think you pretty much said too. So three of us kind of walked around that. Anything you want to add to what I'm saying or what we're saying? Every time we say when we're preaching, this is what the Bible says. So this is for us teachers. You know, Paul, Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 9 says, we know in part and we prophesy in part. And I think in the context of 1 Corinthians, knowledge is related to the gift of teaching, especially when it's word of knowledge or speaking knowledge. So every time we say, this is what the Bible says, we are saying, this is what the Holy Spirit says. So I wonder if the speaker in the video would hold his teaching to the same standard as he would hold prophecy. If so, maybe he's blaspheming. Yeah, that, that's a very good point because we, what we're, we would argue again that the Bible teaches very confidently, very, very clearly that not many of us should be teachers because there's a stricter judgment given to teaching. And yet 
Joel too is a democratization of the spirit of prophecy, and 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 Paul encourages that we all earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. So even in the New Testament, the weight of preaching God's inspired, inerrant, infallible Scripture has a deeper weight to it than the practice and weighing and testing of prophetic revelation. So I think I think that's a, a solid point, uh, guys. We're already twenty minutes in. Do we want to watch this next clip? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Let's do it. Clip numero dos. Deuteronomy 18 says that a prophet who gets his prophecy wrong is presumptuous. And 2 Peter 2 says false teachers will speak arrogant words of presumption, meaning they're going to speak things that will not come to pass out of their own presumption. The gift of prophecy in the New Testament was held to the same standard as the gift of prophecy in the Old Testament. Behold. I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tell them and lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness when I did not send them or charge them. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. So we did not uh, show the clip of him going through uh, Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18. Uh, just for obvious purposes, we've unhashed this so many times. We're happy to do it again, but we'll do it as briefly, I think, as possible. Um, going through these clips, Deuteronomy 13 talks about a prophet who, uh, in fact, gets it right and tries to lead you after other gods. Deuteronomy 18 talks about a prophet who actually gets it wrong. Um, anyway, that kind of sets the stage for that conversation. Anybody want to dive into this clip first and foremost? I know Miller has got some sermons and thoughts and all that good stuff on on this clip. Miller, you want to go? Oh, I just I've preached on this passage so many times now, um, and I I'm actually kind of curious to hear Keener's perception on this uh, or perspective, not perception. Um, so, uh, Craig, I've I've argued over and over again that there is a uh, I've taken a, a different position than Wayne Grudem has, where he would say, you know, Old Testament prophets infallible, New Testament prophets uh, fallible. And I, I've always said, I don't think that there's any change when it comes to the new covenant uh, in regards to the nature of prophecy. Uh, the only thing that I feel like is different between the old and new covenant when it comes to the nature of prophecy has to do with who all gets the spirit of prophecy, that being all of God's people. Um and so uh, then the, the question becomes, well, then how do I deal with Deuteronomy 18? If a person speaks it presumptuously, uh, they, you know, they get it wrong, uh, then, then shouldn't they be considered a false prophet? And so my argue to, argument has been, well, to find out how Israel themselves carried out this law, you have to go through the Old Testament and find false prophets and see how they carried it out. And it seems with guys like Nathan, that's not how they carried it out. They didn't consider him false for speaking presumptuously to David. Um, what is your take on this? I've always just been kind of curious to know uh, if you are, I've always, I, I think I've assumed that you're on the continuity side of this, but I'm just, I'd, I'd like to hear some more evidence and your thoughts. When it uses the word presumptuously, if you look it up in Hebrew, you see where else the word is used. It has to do with speaking with a high hand or speaking rebelliously against God, counseling rebellion against God. That's not talking about somebody who says, the Lord says this is going to happen on Tuesday. Oops, it was Wednesday. Um, yeah, so we are fallible. We know in part and we prophesy in part. Paul says that. And in Deuteronomy, it's, I mean, the context, it's talking about leading you astray from the Lord your God. And again, if we hold teaching to the same standard, I think some of the people in this video are guilty of certainly speaking presumptuously in the way they're defining presumptuously. Um, maybe they're not counseling rebellion against the Lord their God, although they are certainly contradicting scripture quite a bit. Um, but coming coming back to the, the point about how it was done, in the Old Testament, you have some people like Samuel, uh, the word of the Lord was rare. Visions weren't frequent in those days. But then Samuel, none of his words fall to the ground. That's presented as is unusual, as extraordinary. And then Samuel ends up mentoring these other 
other prophets. So you have the sons of the prophets gathered before Samuel, prophesying uh, apparently all, all together. He's kind of supervising, mentoring, making sure they're on track. Uh, you also have Elijah and Elisha mentoring other prophets. In, the, in, the, in 1 Corinthians 14, you couldn't have that. The church in Corinth had only been around for a couple years by the time 1 Corinthians is written. So Paul counsels peer review. Let two or three prophesy at a time, and then let the other prophets judge. But again, he says, you can all prophesy one by one. Acts chapter 2 that Josh mentioned earlier, uh, you're... He, he takes the speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost. He says, this is a fulfillment of what Joel said when Joel said, your sons and daughters will prophesy. He, he goes on, uh, he actually adds in a line to Joel there, uh, and they shall prophesy, adds that in again, just so you don't miss the point, that the chief characteristic of the outpouring of the Spirit in, in the age when the Messiah has been enthroned at God's right hand, the chief characteristic of that is the spirit of prophecy hearing from God, dreams, visions, uh, prophecies in a, in a narrower sense. Uh, I think Acts also uses it in a broader sense. But to deny, to deny that that's for today is to say that Peter was wrong in calling it the last days, which I think is a solid exegesis of, of Joel. It is talking about an eschatological time, an end time. And it should be the characteristic of the body of Christ. So if what we have, um, as Daniel Kalenda has pointed out, if, if what we have among Pentecostals and Charismatics is not right, and it's not always right, but if none of it is right, well then please show us how it should be done. Because if it's not done, if the Spirit is not speaking today, then maybe we're not in the age when the Spirit is poured out, and maybe the Messiah has not been enthroned. I mean, it undercuts Peter's whole argument for the gospel on the day of Pentecost. It undercuts the entire argument of the book of Acts and Paul's, Paul's letters for Gentiles being welcomed into the people of God because we have the Spirit. Well, in Acts chapter 10, that's manifested with speaking in tongues and, and, and praising God. And I'm not saying everybody has to speak in tongues, and I'm not saying everybody has to prophesy in the narrow sense of the term. But if the Spirit has not been poured out already, or if the Spirit has been poured back, <laughs> I mean, he says it's the last days. If it was the last days in the day of Pentecost, if it's anything, if last are days now, uh, maybe, maybe the lastest of days for all we know. Cessationism can't be faithful to the heart of New Testament theology when, when it makes arguments like, like well, I'm talking about the basic argument for cessationism right. now. In terms of the, uh, in terms of the, um, you know, the prophesying rebellion against the Lord, uh, his his jumping from Deuteronomy to Second Peter without taking careful time to explain in context each one. Well, I don't think if he explained each one in context, he would come come to the conclusion he came to. Yeah, I'd be curious to know if the the word for presumptuous or whatever cognate of it from second peter 2 if it was the same in the septuagint of deuteronomy 18 i would want to know that exegesis i my guess is it's probably not the same uh neither here nor there um i, I wanted to ask so i'm imagining a cessationist here like hey we we don't deny that the spirit was poured out and we don't deny that that inaugurated the last days, but now that we have the Bible completed, that special fireworks show of a moment on Pentecost and in those short years afterward, kind of got things launched and God poured out his spirit for revelation. We agree with you where there were dreams and visions and all of those things, but now that spirit of revelation has been trumped by the greatest revelation of all, the Bible. And so now we don't need all that other charismatic stuff anymore. It's still the last days for sure, but Acts 2 was talking about a special moment in history. What would you say to that? I'd say they have to read their theology into it. That's not what the text says. And, you know, if you don't start with the premise, I mean, where does Scripture say that it's supposed to cease? You have this pattern through history where God was doing that. You'd think he would give some sort of forewarning if it was supposed to stop. 
But instead of giving a forewarning, we get instructions for what to do in the house churches. We get instructions about spiritual gifts. We see the norm of the, of the growing church in the book of Acts. If you don't start with the premise that this all stopped, where are you going to get that from? You can't get it from church history because it didn't all stop. You, you can't get it from the Bible because it doesn't say that. And if they're worried about uh, prophecy introducing post-biblical doctrine, well, their teaching is itself a post-biblical doctrine. It's not taught Amen. in Scripture. And so, and then as far as prophecy competing with Scripture, you know, if somebody's coming up with a post-biblical doctrine, you know, I'm not obligated to believe that. I mean, that's not what prophecy is for. Prophecy is not the only way God speaks. So you see, you see through Scripture, uh, while the Old Testament was being written, you see uh, Elijah actually didn't write any of the Old Testament, so far as we know. But Elijah, uh, he was lamenting because Jezebel had killed prophets of the Lord. Well, their prophecies aren't recorded in Scripture. You have Obadiah, I think it's 1 Kings 18, uh, hid 100 prophets by 50s in the cave. Their prophecies are not recorded in Scripture. You take in, in the in the New Testament. So while while the New Testament is is undergoing being written, Paul speaks of you know let two or three prophesy, then let the others judge. He doesn't actually limit it to two or three during a service, but you know average house churches probably wouldn't hold more than forty people. Probably a lot of them held less than that. But let's just say just two or three prophecies per house church per week from the day of Pentecost up through, say, the year 70, we may be talking about, we're talking about hundreds of thousands. I think I calculated once like 700,000, something like that. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of prophecies given. Did they compete with scripture? Do they all have to be recorded in scripture because they're prophecies? There's a difference between saying, okay, this is what I'm hearing God saying. Or, or even thus says the Lord. There's a difference between that. Thus says the Holy Spirit, like we have with the model with Agabus and the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. There's a difference between that and saying it has to be written in Scripture. Scripture is, is the canon. It's the measuring stick. It's the, it's the minimal amount that we can all agree on. It's enough. It's sufficient for us to test every other claim. Most prophecies aren't even dealing with, with doctrine. You know, it may be something as simple as God loves you, which is, you know, you could say from the gift of teaching pretty easily as well. And Romans 8 says the spirit bears witness together with our spirit that we're God's children. You know, if, if you've got people who don't believe God ever speaks outside of, outside of scripture, what happens if the spirit is bearing witness to your spirit uh, that you're God's child when you're not reading the Bible, is that a demon? <laughs> is that your imagination? If you don't have the spirit bearing witness that you're God's child, maybe you're not God's child. According to Romans chapter 8, verse 9, anybody who doesn't, doesn't have the spirit, they're not God's child. I'm, I do believe that people, probably most cessationists do have the spirit bearing witness with their spirit. Even the, even the hard cessationists who say uh, God isn't speaking anymore. But I don't think they're consistent with that. And, and I'm not saying you have to feel a certain thing for God's spirit to be bearing witness, but having once been unsaved and now being saved, I, I do know the difference. Amen. I, I want to make sure that we fairly respond to the claims that are made in this video. One, we talked about Deuteronomy 13 just a moment ago. If someone's performing signs, wonders, and miracles and telling you to worship a false god, we would just wholeheartedly say that's wrong that's false yes. the bible warns you about these kinds of folks coming around yes. we're not into that now deuteronomy 18 was brought up by uh this the the clip by nathan here in the cessationist documentary and deuteronomy 18 does speak of a prophet and it speaks of potentially a prophet but then also a line of prophets kind of a, a both and approach in that uh, there was a uh, there was a line of priests, but then one high priest that was to come. There was going to be a line of kings, but there was going to be one king that was to come. There's going to be a line of judges, but then one judge, right? All, all culminating in Christ. So uh, this passage in Deuteronomy 18 is talking about a line of 
prophets, but it is also talking about the prophet being Jesus who is to come. We see in John chapter 1, 19 through 21, uh, they ask John the Baptist, are you the prophet? And where are they getting that? They're getting it from Deuteronomy. Uh, also in Acts chapter 3, 22 through 23, um, this direct quotation from Peter says, uh, you know, Moses talked about this prophet that he was going to raise up like Moses. Uh, well, that's Jesus. Okay. So both of these are saying Deuteronomy 18 is about the Messiah. Now, Miller, can you help me work through, because you've done this a little bit uh, in, in your sermon, how this is can be about a line of prophets and the Messiah, but how this doesn't necessarily have to apply to all prophetic ministry in the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, I, I think it does apply to prophetic ministry in a general sense, especially after Keener mentions the the nature of what uh, speaks presumptuously mean, like a high-handed command that is like, you definitively have to do this because they're also required to listen to this prophet. But he's also talking about, um, so in the same way that you have to listen to the commands of the king that are coming forth, which at this time there was no king. A king wouldn't come around for hundreds of years later. Um, but there were going to be you know, judges pretty soon and prophets that were uh, in line right after Moses, uh, Joshua being the next one in line. And so you, you've got these four offices in Israel that are sort of held to this higher standard. And, and Deuteronomy, Moses is sort of warning the people of Israel when they go into the land of Canaan, like, here's what you can expect when these officials are put in this place. And so here's what you can expect of Joshua coming next. Uh, if he's high handed and, and in this matter tells you to do something that leads you away uh, from Yahweh, then that is now false, which Joshua doesn't do. However, we do see this happening a whole lot in uh, Jeremiah 23, which the uh, the guys from the cessationist movie do point out. Um, and in Deuteronomy 23, you see three things that are happening. These prophets are predicting, or they're, they're prophesying in such a way that those who are in sin, you know, for instance, sacrificing their children to idols, uh, don't stop doing their sin. They're prophesying in such a way that uh, it, it it encourages rebellion and fails to cause people to uh, repent because or, or think that the impending doom isn't coming their way either. They're not under judgment. Um, I'm trying to remember the third thing I mentioned. I've got this all in my notes. I don't have it here, unfortunately. Um, uh, oh, or they're leading you into sin directly, which you actually do see throughout Jeremiah. Like he confronts all of those specific prophets. Uh, one prophet who says, oh, you know, he comes in with the yoke over his neck and he says, hey, we're going to be taken away into Babylon. Don't fight against the Babylonians. Okay. They're going to take us away. We're going to lose this battle. And this other prophet comes in and breaks the yoke and says, no, nah, it'll be two years. Well, the guy died two, two months later. So now we know that he was a false prophet. And it's interesting that it's two months instead of that he dies rather than two years of servitude that they were going to have. And then you got other guys that are literally committing adultery that Jeremiah confronts. They're in sin and they're leading others into sin. So you see all of these examples play out in, in Jeremiah uh, and specifically it's spelled out in Jeremiah 23, but that's not the nature of what happens with Nathan though. Nathan speaks presumptuously trying to genuinely represent God to David. And then guess what? The Lord comes and corrects him. And you know what he does? David doesn't pick up a stone and kill Nathan. Nathan comes back and says, you know what, David, unfortunately, you're not the man to do it. You're a man of bloodshed. Uh, your son is going to be the one to do it for me. And so he cleans up his own mess. Nowhere is Nathan then considered a false prophet for having gotten it wrong and spoken presumptuously because he didn't speak in a heavy handed way that led David away from Yahweh. Hmm. Did I sum that up? It's good. Yeah, super helpful. And uh, for those who are asking about the continuity, discontinuity view, I don't know that there's an entire book written on that Keener. thing, even though we definitely, definitely need one coming. Uh, uh, but this is from Tanya Harris. Uh, she wrote a book, uh, The Church Who Hears God's Voice. Uh, she does reference that in this book and kind of I, I pulls it out of church history, pulls it out of the scripture, does fair exegesis. Uh, she came on the show. You can watch that interview if you want, but you can also pick up that whole book. I think that would be super interesting. Uh, do you guys want to watch the next clip or does anyone have something they would like to add? Let's watch it. Silence is a good sign. We're going to move to the next clip in three, two, one. If you are not earnestly desiring spiritual gifts, especially prophecy, you are sinning. They keep making the argument that we're sinning because we're disobeying a command of God by not seeking the gift of prophecy. Sam Storms and others who make that kind of argument know that all the commands of the Bible come to us with an assumed context. We might go to Matthew 10, 
and the commands that Jesus gave to his disciples when they went out on mission for him. And we could point after point after point show how Paul did not obey those commands in his own missions. He did take money from churches. He did take more than one cloak with him. So we have to accept the fact that biblical commands come to certain specific people with certain specific assumptions. The same thing is true with regard to the command to seek the gift of prophecy in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. It came in the context where God was still giving the gift of prophecy to the church. If we can show that the gift of prophecy is no longer being given to the church, the command is no longer obligatory for us. I'm sorry I laughed. Dr. Keener gave me one of those like eyes like, oh, context. It cracked me up. Okay. Uh, Roundtree, do you have anything to say on behalf of Dr. Storms? Um, uh, I'll, I'll let you kind of sub in for him. Uh, what are your What are your thoughts on Sam Waldron's absolute fair critique of Sam Storms? <laughs> Sorry. Well, Sarcasm no, he, implied. I, I liked that he broadened it to try to not make it a personal attack against Sam. He said Sam and people who teach this. And so I, I, I respect that he tried to not make it personal. I think that's good. Uh, and he's right. We have to pay attention to context. So, you know, if Paul says, hey, bring me some parchments. We don't need to go like running around trying to find somebody with the same name to give parchments to. I mean, obviously that'd be silly. Um, so of course we have to pay attention to context. Uh, Matthew chapter 10 is a very uh, certainly specific context of Jesus with his 12 Jewish apostles reaching the tribes of Israel. Uh, Jesus will expand on that in Matthew 28 saying, go out and make disciples of all nations. They're meant to be a parallel. It goes from Israel to the nations. Jesus gives his disciples authority. He ends after the resurrection saying all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now they're not just preaching as in Matthew 10. Now they're making disciples. Uh, and now Jesus doesn't send them and, uh, and kind of follow up. He actually is with them always, even to the very end of the age. If anything, this is a... Um, I, uh, this is somewhat of an argument for continuation of the gifts because if uh, before the resurrection... Jesus was granting authority to do these great signs. And then after the resurrection, he's saying all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We could argue that the uh, miracles actually, uh, given the expanded scope that we should expect them, it wouldn't be like my go-to argument, but it is one. And I think it is a, uh, it can be definitively proven that Matthew is paralleling these passages. Now to our purposes, when it comes to first Corinthians 14, one, uh, he says that, uh, you know, you have to pay attention to the context. The verse says, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. And he says, uh, the context that came in a context when God was giving gifts to the church. Again, it's baking the conclusion into the premise. Uh, and the conclusion is God isn't giving the gifts to the church. Therefore, we don't need to honor that commandment. Um, now he does say, if it can be shown that God is no longer giving those gifts and it is possible that Sam Waldron, uh, went on a massive defense of cessationism after that, and it got cut. Um, but as a continuationist, I'm still waiting for that defense to be made. So, uh, in the absence of that defense, uh, in the totality of the documentary, uh, what I would say is the context suggests that, uh, the, the context, like our going assumption, when we read, uh, a verse in, uh, an epistle of Paul, not like a narrative contextualized Jewish mission, but when we read a verse in one of Paul's epistles, our going assumption should be, we should obey that thing. And, and we should require overwhelming evidence to go against a really clear command. That's what I would say. Uh, what about yeah, you, Dr. So Keener? In, in context, Paul? just we're making sure. The reason he quotes Matthew 10 is because later Matthew 10 is not followed. You're saying, yes, there is biblical context for that because in Matthew 10, he says, lost house of Israel. Matthew 25 or Matthew 28, he says, 
to all nations. So there's context to break the, the obedience of said, you know, uh, commands or, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, certain prohibitions and certain kind of guidelines of how to preach said gospel. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas Matt, uh, 1 Corinthians 14 does not have a single stipulation to it. There's not a single shred of evidence that suggests that the gift of prophecy will cease, but that conclusion has been baked in. So we've walked through, if you're watching this video, this is the first video you've watched because you're here, you're here for Dr. Keener. Uh, just go back to some of the other content that we've done. We've debunked the cluster argument. We've debunked the cascade argument. We've debunked this idea that only apostles and prophets were performing, performing certain sign gifts or apostolic sign gifts as they are so-called, which we would reject that category. Uh, we've gone through and said throughout history and through the scriptures, there is a complete uh, overwhelming amount of evidence that the gifts of the Spirit will continue until Christ returns. So he is correct in saying, if you can prove that prophecy uh, is no longer for today, then we don't have to follow that command. But that's like saying, if you can prove that Christ didn't raise from the dead, then Christianity is vain. You can't prove it, and you can't prove that prophecy hasn't ended because there is no evidence to suggest otherwise. Uh, anyway, I've ranted on, so has Michael. I want to doc- toss it over to Dr. Keener. Well, Matthew 10, actually, you you see a continuity. John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2 says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus in chapter 4, 17 says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then in chapter 10 and verse 7, he sends the disciples saying, Preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's a a continuity there. And so taking Matthew 10 in context that's really important because it will build to who the king is in the kingdom of heaven that we're preaching. And that is the one who can say in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We, we should expect a continuity with some of the things like the signs and wonders uh, and also the living simply for prosperity teachers, just to throw that in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 10. But Matthew, Uh, And this is on the the standard view that Mark wrote first and Matthew is using Mark. I think I could show that actually if you think that um, if you think otherwise, then you're actually going to undermine the authority of Scripture. But we won't go into that. So, um, well, actually, should I go off into that now that I've started? That'd be nice. (laughs) (laughs) um, You know, if, 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 if Mark comes from Peter, as within living memory of Mark's writing, um, Papias says, if if Mark goes back to Peter, then for Mark to include almost only what appears in Matthew, with just like a couple exceptions, uh, we would have to be saying that it didn't come from Peter, uh, or that Peter only remembered the same things that Matthew uh, reported, and that since Mark's accounts actually are longer and more words than what you have in Matthew, that Mark or Peter just made stuff up to fill in what was in those stories. I think that kind of undermines the, but anyway, we all, we all can. Uh, so coming, coming back to the point, um, Matthew 10 includes material from the sending of the 12, but then it also includes material that's in Mark chapter 13. And Matthew also includes another saying that isn't in Mark 13, but is consistent with the idea there. Matthew 10, 23, and you won't have finished going throughout all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Son of Man hasn't come yet. So Matthew 10 is not intended just for his strictly only historical purposes. I mean, it is historical, but it's not only for that. It's also meant to teach us which was the standard practice for ancient biography and historiography. So it's not just epistles, you know, or something like that that's inspired. All scripture is inspired by God. That includes the narratives. Now, the way we draw lessons from narratives is not... um, is not just by like everything is a positive model. They're positive models, they're negative models, but this is a positive model where Jesus sends his followers out. The one thing that's that's rescinded later in Matthew is 
Matthew in Matthew 28. Now it's to all the nations. But otherwise, I think we should expect a lot of continuity. And, and we do see in the book of Acts, uh, Paul actually, depending on hospitality, and shaking dust off his feet <laughs> when the, he's the cast out. Peace model. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The person's I mean, peace model of evangelism is yeah, and, and not everything is the same in every list anyway. I mean, in in, in Mark six, you've got uh, something different than in Matthew ten and in Luke ten. I think Jesus sent the disciples out on more than one occasion, so I don't have a problem with this. But um, but you see. One time they're sent without sandals, another time they're sent with sandals, and there are ways to harmonize those. But really, I think you know we're dealing with more than one set of instructions, and there there's there's some variation. But the basic principle about going out to reach unreached people, uh, at least in a in a culture where hospitality is valued, you you, you go and you stay among the people, um, you welcome the hospitality. You use whatever house receives you, household receives you, is a basis for, for the church there. I mean, some things will vary from one culture to another. Cultural background obviously does make a difference. But the basic principles that God gives us, I think, remain the same. Unless you have a major change and phase in salvation history, like before and after Jesus' coming. but with the gift of prophecy, if there's any change, it should be that we should expect it more because of what was poured out in the day of Pentecost. That's what scripture leads us to expect, not the opposite. I think the opposite just arises from historical circumstances where people weren't familiar with exercising the gift, although as, as you've pointed out, some of them did it anyway without realizing that's what it would be called. But yeah, we need to go back to scripture and just hear hear what scripture really says honestly without imposing our theology on it. If you read scripture inductively, th this happened in Africa when the when the missionaries were kicked out of some countries and Christians were free to to read scripture inductively for themselves, they didn't come up with cessationism. Nobody's going to come up with that unless they're taught that. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Another continuity okay. I'm thinking about is just, is the kingdom of God, you know, preach mm -hmm. the kingdom, heal the sick, preach the kingdom, raise the dead, preach the yeah. kingdom, uh, cleanse the leper, et cetera, cast out the demon, which of course, you know, Matthew 12, 28, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, the kingdom of mm -hmm. God has come upon you. So mm -hmm. given the cons the content of the kingdom, God's reign is accompanied by God exhibiting his reign over uh, the spiritual realm with demons being cast out of the physical realm uh, with mir uh, with healings and miracles being performed. Uh, we should expect that now that Christ is raised to the right hand of God with all authority in heaven and on earth belonging to him, having poured out his Holy Spirit upon the church, we should certainly expect a continuity uh, with that. Is it, If the kingdom of God really is here, and it is, I mean, certainly we await its consummation. But, you know, Acts... Uh, Acts chapter 28, Paul's preaching the kingdom of God. And uh, I mean, if we really live in an age of the kingdom, then we should expect the signs of the kingdom. Signs, wonders, miracles, all the things. So another continuity. Yeah, Josh, what were you going to say? No, I was just going to say we should probably watch because we're 53 minutes in. I want to honor Dr. Keener's time. I think we should try to jump into some of these tongues discussions before uh, we run out of time. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, tongues. Uh, this is the next clip that we have in the cessationist documentary. I, I don't really uh, have them unpack that they believe that tongues is always known human languages, but it's kind of a staple of the cessationist argument. So I, I felt like maybe it wasn't super necessary to include that section uh, because this is the longest clip. This and the next clip, I think are the longest clips that I have from the documentary. So this is clip uh, on tongues as judgment to the Jews. Why did God give this peculiar gift to many Christians in the early church? Paul answers this question in 1 Corinthians 14. He explains that the gift of tongues is a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. He writes, So if the whole church comes together, and everyone speaks in tongues, and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? So what does Paul mean then, that tongues are a sign to unbelievers? 
God chose the nation of Israel and the language of Hebrew as his primary way of revealing himself in the Old Testament. But in Isaiah 28, the Lord tells the leaders of Jerusalem that a sign of their impending judgment would be that he would speak to the people with strange lips and a foreign tongue. The Lord speaking through his prophets is warning the Israelites, I have been sending you prophets. If you don't want to listen to the prophets, people of a strange language altogether will descend upon you and bring destruction to you as a people. Isaiah was prophesying the coming Babylonian captivity, where Jerusalem and God's temple would be decimated and the people would be carried off by foreigners. But in 1 Corinthians 14, where we are told that tongues are assigned to unbelievers, Paul references this same prophecy again in the context of explaining the purpose of the New Testament gift of tongues. By people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. The gift of tongues wasn't meant primarily to be an impressive sign to unbelieving Gentiles who spoke other languages. It is actually a sign to unbelieving Israel that God was judging them, revealing himself to Gentiles, and choosing to speak in languages other than Hebrew. Dr. Keener, you're our resident Pentecostal. I'll just let you pick it up from there. Well, actually, it's a reasonable argument. That's a, re that's a pretty hard passage uh, that is much, much debated among biblical scholars. So uh, I think uh, actually a lot of scholars think that, you know, referring back to what Isaiah says in context, it is a sign of judgment. And, and that may well be, that may well be correct. Now, as for tongues always being known human languages, uh, in most cases, like in 1 Corinthians, you have to have a spiritual <laughs> gift of interpretation. So it's not a language known necessarily among those who are present. That was true on the day of Pentecost. It wasn't true on in Acts 10 or Acts 19 or in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. So I think, though, that glossa does mean language. And that definitely is a communication. I don't think it's just babbling if it's genuine tongues. I do think that some of what may pass for tongues today may be what Romans 8 calls groaning. <laughs> I mean, the spirit, it can be this, people can be moved by the spirit, but if it's, if it's tongues, tongues are something that are articulate. But I hear my wife get on the phone and speak in Munikatuba. It sounds like tongues to me. I, mean, I, I don't know. I don't know the difference. You know, when I when I hear uh, certain languages that are especially when they're uh, not formed the way Indo-European languages or something like that are formed, we do have a number of cases where there are reports of people actually hearing the language and recognizing it. Given all the languages, that's obviously not a majority of cases, but. Um, but it's sometimes a rather convincing, rather convincing thing. I have, uh, well, I had a former, I had a student who is now doing her, her PhD. And the reason that she's a follower of Jesus is because she grew up in a home of followers of Jesus, but they were followers of Jesus because her mother, uh, who was Orthodox Jewish, had gone to a, a Pentecostal church where there was, uh, the pastor was, praying in tongues, and she recognized it as perfect Hebrew. And he was, you know, he hadn't been to Bible college or, you know, he didn't, he didn't know Hebrew. <laughs> and so she became a, a follower of Jesus. So, I mean, we have, we have cases like that. And there's also a debate about the tongues of angels. So whether it has to be human language, uh, probably half the scholars think that Paul is actually saying it could be tongues of angels, and about half the scholars say no. I think it's probably hyperbole. But the point of the tongues is not so we can like try to, I mean, when I, it first started happening to me, I was listening to it with my just converted uh, intellectual mind, you know, thinking like, trying to parse the grammar and figure out like, okay, this, this is evocative form. This is, you know, but we're not, <laughs> we're not called to do that with tongues. It's, it's our spirit praying to God. The understanding is unfruitful when we do it, Paul says. So he says, what do we do? We'll pray with us, with our spirit. We'll pray with the understanding also um, in context, tongues and interpretation, both are, are spiritual gifts, so they're both from, from the Spirit, uh, whether 
the spirit is working through our spirit or our, or our mind, uh, affective or cognitive, both are works of the spirit. We need both. We see that elsewhere in scripture. Romans 8 talks about the mind of the spirit. It also talks about the spirit bearing witness with our spirit. But it, it's not just, um, we don't have to worry about the language. What, what our, our role in tongues is, is that we're praying to God. You know, it's the Holy Spirit's role to, to make the language come out right. And we just want to be sensitive to the, the Holy Spirit. Now, some have argued that um, there are formulaic implicatures. Actually, we do this in our own languages often when we pray. I mean, I hear a lot of repetition and a lot of prayer in English at times. Uh, and especially, you know, we keep addressing God in our prayer. So there's going to be that kind of repetition. But um, relevance theory has suggested that communication can happen in different ways. So the big thing is that it's communication, however, however it's formulated. But some people say, well, studies have been done. Praying in tongues always ends with a vowel. Look, I've been praying in tongues since, what, November 2nd, 1975. And my my prayer in tongues doesn't always end with vowels. I know I know that's not true. I mean, maybe true in some circles, but it's not it's not true for everybody. Uh, now, in the case of tongues, you know, I can speak from some experience because I've experienced that. But I'm not speaking simply on the basis of experience. I'm speaking on the basis of scripture. So earlier I talked about how it's normal in this age for uh, prophecy, visions, and dreams based on Acts to I've never had a vision. I'd love to have one. I hope I have one. But sooner or later, I'm going to see Jesus face to face. But I, there, there are some things we're talking about. I mean, like the, the signs and the wonders. My gift is mainly in teaching. So I'm not saying everybody has all the gifts. But in the gift of teaching, you don't just talk about the gifts you have. You talk about what Scripture says. And... Paul, Paul is clear. I mean, he prays in tongues more than all of them. It's a, it's a, it's a useful gift for building oneself up. I think in the in the film they say you're not supposed to be concerned with building yourself up. Well, yeah, Paul is talking in First Corinthians twelve to fourteen, especially about building up the body of Christ. But in terms of building yourself up, if that's wrong, then do you just read the Bible for sermon preparation? Do you never read it for personal edification? I mean, of course, we're supposed to build ourselves up. Jude says that praying, praying, building yourselves up, praying in the Holy Spirit, or, or praying is led by the Spirit, which I think can be in your own language or or in tongues. But it's not just limited to. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm I'm going on too long, but no, I like it. I think I think that's super helpful, and that gives us a kind of foundation for what the gifts of tongues is and does. I I, I want to take a second to kind of respond to what I think maybe a reductionistic use of tongues here. It, it seems as if the cessationist is saying, look, tongues is used for evangelism to the lost and tongues uh, is used as a sign of judgment to the Jews. That's what tongues is. I think that is a reductionistic view of tongues. In fact, the only time we ever see tongues being used um, for evangelism, uh, I don't even really think it's being used for evangelism. If it was being used for evangelism, Peter would not have needed to stand up on the day of Pe Pentecost and preach. Um, it seems as if what was taking place in Acts 2 was akin to worship or prayer extolling God in, in his mighty, wondrous works and deeds. This act of worship drew a crowd which required Peter to stand up and speak in an intelligible uh, understanding by all human languages, probably I would assume in Greek, uh, as that would have been more of a unifying language and potentially translated. I don't know how exactly it worked, uh, but this was communicated through the work of Peter. So it, tongues, even in the account that it was used, wasn't being used for evangelism. And secondly, right. I will agree that the citation of Isaiah was it Isaiah 28, is 28, a reference 11. of Babylonians coming in to judge. However, I think using that as the primary interpretive key ignores <laughs> the actual context of 1 Corinthians 14, because in 1 Corinthians 14, he's actually saying, don't speak in tongues unless there is an interpreter. So if, prophet, if tongues was only being used to judge Jews and as a sign to judge the Jews and witness 
to the Gentiles, then why would you want an interpreter there? Right. That would actually <laughs> defeat the judgment aspect of its yeah, intent. Whole, right. It's well. supposed to be judging the Jews. Why would you want to give an interpretation there? No, that doesn't make sense. In fact, it's being applied to the unbeliever and unlearned who is in the midst of the church of Corinth. So I think what's happening is Paul is grabbing Isaiah 28 and talking about how it's judgment and and it disordered for a Babylonian to come in and conquer a Jew and not understand and comprehend what is taking place there. In the same way, you're trying to instruct a Gentile, uh, you're trying to instruct an unbeliever, an unlearned person uh, through tongues somehow, but they don't comprehend what is being said. The, the judgment over the Jews is now seems to be being applied somehow to the Gentiles. I think he's using the quotation and the application of that quotation differently for a different people group. Uh, Michael Roundtree, I, I think I heard you speaking up there for a second. Oh, sure. Well, yeah, and to even jump fur dive further into Isaiah 28, uh, the uh, Isaiah's critics were uh, were saying that his teaching is just like a bunch of childish babble, and Isaiah's mm -hmm. response is to prophesy to them, well, uh, people of strange tongues are going to come. You think this is childish babble? Mm -hmm. You're about to hear some childish babble when you hear people speaking in a foreign language because they've overtaken your nation. And so it's a little bit of a reaping and a sowing thing, but it is a sign of judgment. So I actually agree with them. It's a sign of judgment, but they're they're missing Paul's application of it. Paul's Paul's <laughs> trying to say like, hey, in uh, in church settings, when you speak uninterpreted tongues, it's like you're replicating that scenario. You're that's good. Uh, you're replicating a scenario where you are putting out there a sign of judgment toward the unbeliever that walks in, and that's not what you want. What you want is for unbelievers who walk in. You want a sign of grace, not of judgment. So don't have uninterpreted tongues because then you're putting them in the same situation as ancient Israel where they heard a bunch of babblers around them and it was a sign of judgment. And uh, and in this case, when they hear a bunch of babblers uh, uninterpreted, they're going to leave the place and the judgment of God actually will land on them because they won't repent and believe the gospel and be saved. And, uh, and so they'll actually experience judgment themselves. When you have an unbeliever walk in, you don't want that. You you want them to escape the judgment. You want them to be saved. So speak in an intelligible language. Uh, that'd good. be one thing I'd say. That's at least my interpretation. And it's a common one. Uh, the other thing that I would say is it is redu you use the word reductionist re reductionistic, Josh. I think it's really limiting uh, the purpose of tongues within the same passage. Tongues uh, mm -hmm. is not uh, is not just a sign of judgment. It is also a um, a spiritual gift for edifying the believer. So it has another purpose in Acts chapter two, which we've talked about. It's a sign of grace because it's a reversal of the tower of Babel, where mm. at the tower of Babel, you had God judging the nations by scrambling their speech. And then at Pentecost, you had God gracing the nations by unscrambling speech. And there's much more, but the point that Luke is trying to say, and there are a whole bunch of allusions to the Tower of Babel story, is that tongues in Acts 2 is a sign of grace, the grace of the Spirit in their midst, uniting a one people of God, bringing together the nations that were formerly judged. Now the nations are coming in to the kingdom of God. That's Acts chapter 2. It's a sign of grace there in that context. 1 Corinthians 14, verse, uh, verses 21 and 22. It is a sign of judgment. But again, we just have to look at each thing. They're, they're throwing the word context at us. That's what I'm trying to do. Same thing. I'm trying to say, yes, it, it is a context thing. You're missing the context of Isaiah 28. You're missing how Paul applies it in 1 Corinthians 14. You're missing the broader biblical context in other ways that the gift of tongues is used. And so uh, those are a few things that I would say. So <laughs> just a few. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. We are probably at that point in our show where we need to begin wrapping up. Uh, I want to offer it up to Michael Miller and Dr. Keener real quick. Do y'all have any kind of thoughts on that passage there in tongues that we were just chatting about? Oh, I've got one thought. Uh, I, okay. I would just echo the words of Paul uh, to the cessationist friends. Uh, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Uh, I love that gift. <laughs> <laughs> Context, Michael. You can't just take Paul and say it, you know, as if it's true. Well, it is true, I suppose, that you do speak in tongues more than the cessationist. Okay. Dr. Keener, uh, to you. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. First Corinthians 14, 18. I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding. So in church, the tongues needs to be interpreted, but there's also that personal use of tongues. Obviously, if Paul's saying he speaks in tongues more, but in church, he'd rather speak even five words than uh, in Greek than 10,000 in an unknown tongue means he's doing most of it personally and privately. Um, and, you know, he talks about that earlier. When I when I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, my understanding is unfruitful. Um, he says, if, if there's no interpreter present, then either pray that you get the interpretation or just, you know, pray yourself to God in, in the tongue. And, and also in the... Um, in the film, in the context, they talk about how the early Pentecostals got it wrong, thinking that it would be an evangelistic tool. So I'm not sure why they would think it should be an evangelistic tool. And they say the Pentecostals, you know, changed it uh, to match their experience afterwards. They were already praying in, in tongues is prayer, even, even when they were getting it wrong. And their change came around, I mean, already they were starting to shift around 1906. So early on in the Azusa Street Revival. But I often talk about that, how the uh, early Pentecostals, they were part of radical evangelicals who were emphasizing holiness, missions, gift of healing. So people like A.J. Gordon, Baptist, for whom Gordon Conwell is named, um, A.B. Uh, AB Simpson, founder of Christian and Missionary Alliance. These were all part of this larger movement of, of radical evangelicals. Well, some of them were praying for, not, not necessarily the people I named, but in this movement, there were people who were praying for missionary tongues so they could hurry up and reach the world so Jesus would come back by the year 1900. Um, Jesus didn't come back by 1900, just in case somebody didn't know that. but. Um, but, you know, it was nice they were praying with with an idea for mission. The early Pentecostals, most of them, uh, realized pretty early on, okay, this doesn't normally work for mission. There were a few reported exceptions, but usually they get to countries thinking, okay, we don't need to learn the language. They get there, oops, well, if mine is a language, it's not the language that's spoken here. And so they, well, they had to just settle there and learn the language. They bought one-way tickets. so. Uh, but then then they often were able to raise up indigenous churches and the gospel spread and you know uh we've got something well some people estimate around 600 million pentecostals and charismatics in the world those are not all orthodox uh, we we wouldn't want to own them all uh, it's it's a sociological definition that's being used but even by by much narrower definitions of the the people we would own, um, we're talking about the the most massive expansion of the church in history. We're talking about um, a shift, like the good news has to be preached among all the nations before the end will come. In my wife's country, they were two percent Christian in the year nineteen hundred. A hundred years later, they were 80% Christian. Now, we know personally <laughs> that that doesn't mean they're all really Christian, but I mean, the gospel has spread and, and the, the shift is now it's 70% of the, of the churches in the global south. So the early Pentecostals who were praying for missionary tongues, they were wrong about the missionary tongues. They, they realized that pretty quickly, but they were right to see a connection in Acts chapter 2 <clears throat> between tongues and mission because Jesus promises, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and, and you'll be witnesses for me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And when the tongues happens, Peter describes it in Acts chapter 2 verses 17 and 18 as is prophetic speech, a form of prophetic speech, speech that God inspires, or if you don't like that word, speech that God moves, empowers. But in Acts 1.8, it's speech to the ends of the earth. What greater sign could God give 
that the purpose of this empowerment was empowerment for mission across all cultural barriers oh. and to enable his people to worship him in other people's languages. And so you have that in the day of Pentecost. Yeah, the languages aren't recognized in Acts chapter 10 or Acts chapter 19. That's not the, the point in those passages. But the, the point of being able to worship God in other people's languages, um, and I'm not saying for every individual, but for the church as a whole, that God has given that gift and God gave that gift on the day of Pentecost. And he hadn't given it before. Again, like in the video, they say Hebrew was the holy language. Well, now God has shown that every language and every culture can be a vehicle for his gospel, for his good news to all the nations. Dr. Kino, we are definitely going to watch that clip next week, and I'm going to copy all of those thoughts and pretend like they were mine, and I will repeat them uh, when we watch that clip, because that's a great point, man. Hey, you know, these guys, they spoke, they wanted to speak in tongues. They thought they were going to do evangelism to the nations, and it didn't work. Joke's on you. It freaking did. Uh, we did reach the nations with uh, the Pentecostals. <laughs> and yeah, and it is the fastest growing missions movement on the planet because of it, right? Like that's that's it. So uh, yeah, I love it. That's a, it's a really good point. Can't wait to bring that up. Not, not, next not week. because the tongues per se, but the tongues were a sign of what the- They were a sign of empowerment. Was about. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I agree. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into this program. Dr. Keener, thank you so much for coming on. If you're out there and you're like, man, I want to check out all the study material, all the resources. Like, where did you guys debunk Ephesians 2.20? Where did you debunk Hebrews chapter 2? How did you engage with 1 Corinthians chapter 13? The cluster argument, the cascade argument, the, the apostolic sign gift stuff. We put all of that in one specific place. It's a study guide going through the cessationist documentary. It's got time stamps uh, of the doc when the documentary said certain things. It's got quotations from the speakers, and then it has our responses to that. If you want to pick it up, it can be found in the newsletter. So there's a link in the description of this video, uh, or if you're on the podcast, a, a link in the description of the podcast. You just click uh, the the newsletter subscribe to the newsletter and you can get signed up they'll send you a copy of that uh, uh of our responses those are the first five videos we did all of our content can be found in there uh, and once you sign up for the newsletter you'll get it emailed to you so that's pretty exciting uh any other closing thoughts from you guys today michael michael okay no, guys Dr. Peter, thank you so much Th thanks uh, i i did the the axe commentary the first one is four volumes i did a shorter one for cambridge um for First Corinthians, I haven't had time to to write a big commentary on that yet, but I have a little one with uh, also with Cambridge. So, uh, guys, don't I let him lie to you, okay? I'm not saying that he's bearing false witness, but I don't know that Keener's ever written anything small, okay? So he's saying small <laughs> as a relative term. That'll be big for most of you, okay? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's not true. He's got some easy. No, it's not true. He's, he's got he's got very accessible books. I'm just I'm just picking yeah. on. Uh, he's got great content. I love Dr. Keener's work. Like I said, I've, I've got his commentaries uh, every time I'm preaching through something. If he's got a commentary on it, I'm using it. So uh, love you, Dr. Keener. Thank you so much for your time and your energy on the program and all of your work in the academic space, man. We, we need you and we need more charismatic scholars. So we're super thankful for you. Yeah, so, so grateful to be with you. I, I always love being with you guys. Cool. Blessings, guys. We'll see you next Monday uh, and Tuesday from 40, Monday and Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time.